Hello everybody, Sam here, engineer, MBA, and investor. And in today's beautiful Sunday, I want to talk about Intelia Therapeutics, latest corporate overview of the company and why I believe Intelia LA is the top dog in the CRISPR space. So before I do jump into today's video, I do want to preface by saying that it's a beautiful day in Toronto or pronounced like Toronto for non-Canadian folks. Uh, but it is a beautiful day. In fact, it's been a beautiful uh, weekend, sunny day yesterday, sunny day today. Uh, hopefully wherever you are, I know it's brutal January, brutal next month or two uh, for most regions around the world. But uh, nonetheless, hopefully you are having a beautiful Sunday. And of course, here, NTLA published their presentation a couple of weeks ago, would say about two weeks ago. And I sort of promised last week that I would make a video on this. I just got tangled with other press releases, other news that came about last week or just this past week. So uh, now I do have time to go over it. And I think there's value of looking over the company and explaining my thought processes of what I think about this company. So first of all, I do want to mention NTLA just like this slide says here, this is, uh, this is really, really uh, uh, correct. So if we go through this slide here, uh, we go through it. It's a NTLA is leading a new era in medicine, first and only company to demonstrate a successful systematic CRISPR genome editing in humans. 50 plus, plus patients have been dosed with NTLA in vivo based therapies, ongoing clinical trials. Three clinical trials have achieved pr human proof of concept. NTLA 2001, NTLA 2002, and OTQ 923. And of course, this is a, a Novartis, uh, Novartis sickle cell disease that utilizes NTLA ex vivo genome and technology. Actually, this one, I don't think I've covered this much actually in this channel. This could be the first time I actually even mention it in a video. Nonetheless, here, uh, positioned uh, to bring forward first uh, ever pivotal study for an in vivo CRISPR based therapy, they're all about in vivo, but they also have some ex vivo going on, just like we saw with Novartis there. 10 plus in vivo and ex vivo program for diseases with high unmet need. Uh, some of them are both wholly owned and partner programs. Some of them are wholly owned, some of them are partner program. Um, and we sort of covered that in recent videos on NTLA, why this is really important for some of their program to be wholly owned. Six collaboration with leading biotech pharma companies. We've seen those partnerships in the past. So of course here, uh, the difference between in vivo and ex vivo is really straightforward. I, you can't really make a claim that in vivo is gonna be the future for everything. You can't make that claim because ex vivo is ex extremely important. That's exactly why this company is working on ex vivo as well. Um, in vivo is basically, you, for example, in 2001, right? You look at the liver, you inject something in the liver and you hope that you know, that disease is potentially cured. Uh, ex vivo is something different, right? Ex vivo requires you to have some sort of manufacturing facility, some sort of extraction facility, some sort of processes that able to get you something out of the liver, for example, edit it in a lab, test it, quality analyze, analyze it, and then inject it back in the human patient, potentially to cure it. Again, specific diseases is more geared, are more geared for in vivo and other type of disease more geared for ex vivo. Okay, and we take a look at, uh, you know, they're, they're going through some high, uh, high level slides here. Of course, treat patient that root cause of their disease, single dose disease, single dose treatment, uh, reduce burden of healthcare over patient's lifetime. Absolutely, this is what every CRISPR company at this point is trying to uh, treat or at least achieve. Okay, so, First of all, I do want to mention that they have two successful so far in vivo programs. They're the only company in the CRISPR space with two successful programs. And how I define two, a successful CRISPR program is one, having amazing data, not just average, but above, well above average data. And two, having, of course, um, having, of course, high safety and efficiency in that data, right? So um, in my opinion, NTLA 2001 and NTLA 2002 have achieved those criteria. That's why I believe this is the company in the leading um, of the race of CRISPR in the CRISPR space. They're 
because they have two successful CRISPR programs, and I just defined what successful means in terms of programs in the CRISPR landscape. Uh, outstanding year 2022 was, and of course, I totally agree, they got more data for NTLA 2002. They got the first set of data for NTLA 2002 um, and extended that as well, and it's just been amazing uh, progress for this company. They were able to nominate three candidate development and till 2003, 6001, and one uh, undisclosed in vivo genome and, uh, knockout program. Curious to see what this knockout include, um, undisclosed in vivo genome knockout program is. I have a feeling it has something to do with base editing, which they filed patent for, but hey, who knows? Um, so, and the cash, and this is really important, and the year with 1.3 billion cash. That's so again, we covered that, I think, in the first two, the second video of this year uh, when it started, um, their highlights of the year. So, amazing cash balance sheet, amazing progress from this company. Really, really curious to see what they they do with the US IND submission for NTL 2001 because, of course, they have NTL 2001 patients, but they're all those outside the US. Uh, but for them to be able to do from in US, obviously, they need to go through US FDA. And actually, from yesterday's video, we saw Brad Lankar, the interviewer, who interviewed John Evans, CEO of Beam Therapeutics, mentioned that most CRISPR companies are just basically dosing patients outside the US because in the US is so complicated, so um, long to get these processes in, and just these companies can't wait that long. And, um, and, and anyways, we'll see where that goes with the US FDA specifically. So milestones for 2023. Submit IND in mid 2023 for until 2001. And like I mentioned, you know, 2001, they still have yet to dose anybody in the US because they need to go through the US FDA. That's one of their milestones. There, that would be, in my opinion, their biggest milestone. Present additional data from ongoing phase one study, uh, and they want they want to prepare this phase three study, which again we talked about in their highlights of. Um, in the press release when the year started. For 2002 though, initiate phase two of ongoing phase one, phase two study in the second, first half of 2023. So of course they're still in phase one, they wanna enter phase two. Of course, same thing with US FDA there for this program, they wanna submit the IND in the first half. Uh, present additional clinical data for the existing program that they have for going with the human data there. Last year we got data which was amazing and this year, they're hoping to extend that uh, success. And in 2003, submit IND filing in the second half of 2023. And 2003, complete IND enabling activities by year-end 2023. So at that point in 2024, it's very possible for this company by sometime in 2024, probably towards the second half of 2024, to have a successful CRISPR program with NTLA 2001, 2002, but also have data for 3001 and 2003, which means you can potentially make the narrative that this company may have four consecutive CRISPR successful programs based on my definition of success earlier in this video. Again, that's just speculation, who knows, but I really think 2024, end of 2024 could be where this, this company really you know, distanced themselves across the board from other CRISPR companies. Uh, in my opinion, they're leading it, but they haven't really distanced themselves. I think they they still have long ways to go. And just a reminder here, NTLA, I mean, 2001, we already covered this. It was the whole ATTR disease there. Uh, and 2002 as well with the HAE. Um, with NTLA 2003 and 2004, uh, 3001, it's ATD liver disease and AATD lung disease respectively. Um, they're looking with the ex vivo part with this is with Novartis, the sickle cells one, the OTQ 923. They have it going on with Novartis uh, there. But look at these wholly owned programs. Three of those wholly pro own, top programs in this in vivo portfolio, they wholly own it, right? And same thing here, you know, the next three programs, at least two programs, I'm going to omit the research program. Okay, until it turns six CD30 plus lymphomas there with the CAR T allos therapy. It's wholly owned. This is really, really relevant. People don't uh, appreciate this. The fact that these these uh, these programs are really, really crucial for a CRISPR company because now you don't have to, you know, share your profits and so on, right? So it's a really, really interesting um, 
interesting positioning for this company because I feel like, and I'm not going to go through all these slides here. They, they go into the very specific of each program, maybe in another video for maybe, you know, 2003 program and 2001 program. And uh, maybe even talk about the Novartis one, the XGV one. I'd love to talk about that one. Um, but nonetheless, this company is really positioned in a really interesting position because not only they have two successful CRISPR programs, one of those programs are wholly owned. And till 2002, now they may end up partnering with a company, right? Don't get me wrong. It's not like it's going to stay there. But the beauty of that is like they have the leverage in that partnership at that point because they can go to like Vertex, they can go to Novartis or Regeneron, or they can go to one of these big pharma companies and say, Yo, look, we already have a successful program with CRISPR 2001, Regeneron, and ourselves were working successfully towards an, you know, a potential FDA approval for that. Like, of course, I'm assuming we're in the year 2024, 2025. And, you know, they can approach these companies and say, look, we have this 2002, right now we fully own it. We're willing to give you maybe 40 to 50% of that program, share the profits, share the commercializations of it. Um, but give us upfront the one to $2 billion because we know we can make it work. We have amazing data already with this program. If you want to get your foot in the door with CRISPR landscape, this is the way to do it. We're doing something no other company is doing with, uh, with specifically with in vivo. Now, there are promises from other companies like Beam Therapeutics, but they have yet to publish any sort of data this year. And in, in the year of 2024, maybe they'll get that data for Beam 201, and that's going to be for ex vivo. So I think, um, sorry, Beam 101, but I, I think that you know, NTLA is an interesting you know, positioning where they can leverage their program, their existing programs, and partnering up, increase that balance sheet from, you know, 1.3 billion, maybe 2.5 billion, maybe 3.5 billion, you know. And I think at that point, they can look into acquiring companies, hiring more talent, um, or and uh, looking into spinning off, you know, say other programs and maybe, you know, going further with base editing, which they sort of alluded to in 2021, sort of went nowhere in 2022. Uh, maybe they want to take that, 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 that route, you know, who knows? I mean, um, I think there's something interesting and we haven't even talked about the other partnership with like Sparring Vision and so on. So I think this company, in my opinion, is the leader of the CRISPR space. I think they've done so well. I think, you know, everything they've done since I got involved in this space, it's been, you know, really, you know, step by step has been a success for this company. My only, you know, negative thought about this company, which I sort of alluded to earlier in this part, um, and just now really was the base settling part. I mean, this is the only thing that I think will come bite them um, in the long term, because they kept mentioning that they want to enter in the base settling space. Now, I don't know if it was a PR move. I don't know if it's just to you know, put out the statement out there for specifically against Beam Therapeutics. I don't know if it's because of the base editing hype in 2021, but they have not delivered on that promise. And I would hold that to them on that one because I think it's extremely important. If you're going to tell investors that, yeah, we're going to look into base editing, if you're going to tell investors about that pattern that they submitted in late 2021 and not do anything about it after a one plus year, that should be a red flag. I think this should be something that should be brought up by investors to this company. Where are you with base settling? Are you going to just close the book on it? Are you still open on it? What are you doing to pursue that? Because a lot of investors are pushing the therapeutic story because there's no other CRISPR company exploring the base settling space. But what if NTLA does that? At that point, I think they distance themselves from the competition, right? But who knows, guys? We'll end this video like this. Thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, like this video if you found value. Subscribe if you're not. And let me know in the comments below what do you guys think about NTLA Therapeutics. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful Sunday. And I'll see you guys in the week. Thank you.